Um, we uh, are very pleased uh, to present our webinar on insights into non-use cancellation proceedings at the USPTO. And our speaker today is Amy Cotton. She's the Deputy Commissioner for Trademark Examination Policy at the USPTO. And in this role, she oversees the Office of Trademark Policy, Petitions, and ID Class, as well as the Trademark Assistance Center, the Office of Trademark Quality Review and Training, the Trademark Law Library, Customer Experience, and Trademark Outreach. So Amy is certainly somebody who knows a lot about what's going on at the USPTO. At the end of the presentation, when we get into the question and answer session, she's going to be joined by uh, two experts. Uh, one is Montia givens pressey She's the a senior attorney in the Office of Trademark Quality Review and Training, and also a legal liaison to the Post Registration Unit, and also Bob Lavash. He's the senior trademark legal policy advisor um, in uh, the Office of the Deputy Commissioner for Trademark Examination Policy. Well, with that, I'm going to step away and turn it over to Amy, who's going to talk you through some insights into the Trademark Modernization Act's non-use cancellation petitions. Thank you, Jason. Good afternoon, everybody. It's uh, really nice to see you again. It's been a while since we've gotten together to talk about the TMA. Uh, if you recall, last year we got together a few times as we went through the rulemaking process and uh, worked through how to, de to develop, with your help, these proceedings. So now we have these proceedings. We implement those on December 18th, 2021, and I thought you might like to know how they're going, and they're going pretty well. A um, couple of things I wanted to share our experiences with you so far, because I bet they will, number one, help you decide about whether to use these proceedings, and we want you to use these proceedings. We did a lot of work on them with, you, with your help. Uh, and number two, we want you to prepare more successful petitions, because I think that's what everybody would like. So let's advance here. So level setting though, uh, a couple of questions that came in, I wanted to make sure um, that everyone knew where we were starting uh, with uh, the TMA. So we're gonna actually start uh, and I'm gonna outline the proceedings for you. So the, the TMA proposed new proceedings to cancel registrations for non-use. This was uh, to facilitate mark clearance, get unused registrations off of the register more quickly, and this is a new mechanism by which to do that without having to go to the board. Now, the first um, proceeding that Congress uh, laid out for us is expungement. Expungement, uh, the target of these proceedings is a mark in a section 144, or 66 registration uh, that has never been used uh, on, all, on some or all of the goods or services identified in the registration. Now, there are three types of proceedings where this new claim or this ground for cancellation is available. One is the petition initiated, initiated proceeding before the director. Another one is a director initiated proceeding. And the third is a cancellation proceeding before the Trademark Trial and Appeal Board. Let me be really clear, because I, I realize there's probably some confusions based on the uh, title of, of the presentation. Um, I'm only addressing the proceedings before the director today. I'm not talking about the Trademark Trial and Appeal Board. Uh, that's, that's not the focus of my presentation. It's really how these uh, petitions before the directors are going. So I apologize for anybody who was tuning in uh, for, for more information about TTAB positions, uh, but I am not going to be addressing that today. Expungement. An expungement proceeding before the director may be instituted in the window of time between year three and 10 years after the registration issues. So Congress though provided an exception um, for this three year period from TMA enactment, which was December, 2020, any three year old registration can be subject to an expungement proceeding. So for the next little less than two years, any uh, registration can be attacked for expungement through these proceedings. You got a two year window left in order to do that. That was designed to try to get some of these older registrations that were unused and just taking up space on the register off. So if you have a, a registration that's been sitting there that's over uh, 10 years, uh, you can use these proceedings to get at those for, for, the, uh, for the next uh, year and a half or so. Now, I want to be really clear about expungement. It is an entirely new statutory basis for cancellation. It only evaluates whether the mark was used on the challenged goods and services prior to the date of the filing of the expungement petition. It's not abandonment. It's not an abandonment claim. Uh, the registrant's intent to resume or to commence use is just not relevant. For that, you have to go to the Trademark Trial and Appeal Board. Furthermore, uh, expungement does not evaluate whether the mark was put into use as of the dates required by the statute. 
That is a question for reexamination, which we're going to next. So the second proceeding that Congress uh, created before the director is called reexamination. And the target of these proceedings is a mark in a section one registration. Hold on one second. Um, the target of the proceedings is a section one registration that was not in use as of the relevant date. So what's the relevant date? Relevant date uh, for the purposes of a 1A registration is the filing date. The per relevant date for the purposes of a 1B application, um, a 1B, reg uh, 1B application would be the later of uh, the filing date of the AAU or the expiration of time to file the statement of use. So the filing date of the amendment to allege use or the expiration of time to file the statement of use. Now, a petition to request institution of reexamination uh, may be filed in the first five years after registration. All right, next slide here. Um, the elements of a complete petition are, are here on the left. Any person may file a petition. The filing fee is $400 per class. We need the petitioner's name, domicile, and email. If it's foreign domicile, the petitioner must provide a designation of a U.S. attorney. Uh, and if represented, the attorney name, postal address, email address, and bar information must all be provided. Now, the petition and the evidence are immediately uploaded into the Trademark Status and Document Retrieval TSDR system. A courtesy email notification is sent to the registrant and the registrant's attorney as appropriate. Now, what should the petition uh, include? The elements are all here. A verified statement um, and documentary evidence of non-use. The verified statement must lay out the elements of the investigation for non-use. Where did you search? How did you search? When did you search? And what did you find as to each uh, source of information relied on? Now that reasonableness of the search and the number and the nature of the sources the petitioner must search will be determined by case by case because it depends on the industry. Um, once a complete petition is filed and has all of the required elements, a courtesy email notice of the filing of the petition uh, will go to the registrant and the registrant's attorney. Now, if there's an element missing, we will consider whether to issue a 30-day letter allowing the petitioner to perfect the petition. And we are most likely to issue a 30-day letter if the director is going to institute a proceeding. It doesn't make sense to issue the letter if we're not going to institute, so that would be a waste of time. Now, the 30-day letter provides uh, the petitioner an opportunity to clarify the evidence of record and the elements of its investigation, um, clarifying statements in the petition, providing a legible URL, a date of access, or a legible copy of the evidence, but no new evidence will be accepted. So this is just to clarify some of the things uh, in the petition that, that may not make sense to the examiner. The number one thing I'm going to specifically note right here, index, index of the evidence. We need the index. We need to know um, what evidence goes to which piece. So if you don't provide it in the petition, you will, we, you will be delaying consideration of your evidence while we issue a 30-day letter asking for it. So index uh, is, is pretty important here. The index for evidence needs to be a separate page and it should link to your evidentiary exhibits. So we'll get back to that in a little bit. Also be really clear with the specific goods and services you are challenging. We've had cases where a petition identifies all the goods and services in a class, but the evidence only goes to one of those items. So be clear what your evidence is supposed to uh, provide evidence of non-use, which goods and services your evidence is providing uh, the non-use uh, prima facie case. Um, once the petition is filed, uh, there is no withdrawal available. Um, so if the prima facie case is made in that petition, the director must institute. So consider that uh, it's not a you know if you if the two parties want to settle, that's that's your business. But we're not going to allow the petition to be with, withdrawn at that point because if there is prima facie case, uh, prima facie case of non-use, we want to address that. We we have an interest as the USPTO to making sure that the registrations we issue are accurate, um, that we have already issued are accurate. All right, sorry, I'm getting some questions. Uh, and for some who are asking, what are sections 144 and 66 registrations? 
Uh, a Section 1 registration is one that was based on um, use or intent to use. A Section 44 registration is one that was based on a Paris Convention filing. And a Section 66 registration is one that was based on the Madrid uh, system, the Madrid protocol. So those are generally foreign incoming applications uh, that have filed via treaty mechanisms uh, into uh, the United States. Okay. Got too many screens going. Okay, so this is, again, this is just an overview because uh, there is a, a presentation that I did many times last year. It's posted on our web page that explains TMA and explains these non-use cancellation proceedings and how they flow. So we're really just doing an overview right now to set the stage um, for what we have been seeing in the way of petitions. So if you need more information about TMA proceedings in general, I urge you to go to our TMA page, which I will show you the link for, uh, and you can, you can review the information there, which lays out the basics of the proceedings. Uh, and there is a, a slide deck there and a recording uh, of the presentations that I made last year, which has it all laid out for you. But again, let's refresh. A petition initiated proceeding, uh, the, the workflow goes like this that you see on the screen. Once the petition is submitted and it's complete, the petitioner is out of the process. This is not an inner parties case. This is now between the, the registrant and the USPTO. It is the director who decides whether the prima facie case is made based on evidence and information in the petition and the USPTO's electronic record of the involved registration. If a prima facie case is established, I said this before, the, inst the director must institute proceedings. We need to take a look at this registration. Uh, if a proceeding is instituted, the examiner will issue both a notice of institution and an office action in the same document. Uh, it directs the registrant to respond within three months with proof of use of the mark on the challenge goods or services. Now, there are three uh, options for the registrant to respond as you see these here. Number one, provide evidence of use. Number two, provide um, a claim of excusable non-use plus evidence. Uh, that's a limited, very limited circumstances. And number three, uh, just delete the challenged goods and services. If the registrant gives us an acceptable response, uh, that can be one of those three, evidence of use, excusable non-use that's accepted, or deletion, then the proceedings are over. Now, what is the evidence of use? The, the registrant must rebut the prima facie case with documentary evidence of use. Um, the registrant can provide um, evidence supporting excusable non-use in limited circumstances. This really only is for Section 44 Paris folks or Section 66 Madrid registrants in the context of an expungement proceeding. So this is not routinely going to be used. This is very, very narrow excusable non-use. Uh, the third uh, you know, response option for the registrant is, of course, is deletion. If the registrant just deletes in the context of the proceeding, um, some or all of the challenge goods and services, it has immediate effect, effect and we will terminate the proceedings immediately. Now, what happens, though, if the registrant, the response is unacceptable, the proof of use is not accepted? Um, at that point, the examiner will issue a final action with another three-month response period. Uh, the registrant must respond with a request for reconsideration and a notice of appeal. Now, in that request, um, if that request for reconsideration contains acceptable proof of use or deletion, then again, we're going to terminate the proceedings. Otherwise, then the examiner's decision to cancel can be appealed to the TTAB and the regular board timelines apply. All right, now we're going to get into the, the meat of what we've been seeing as we've been working on these cases. So we implemented, as I said, December 18th, 2021. Since then, we've received 58 petitions. We have a working group that meets twice a week. Um, this group includes nine high-level policy and petitions attorneys. So these are very experienced folks. We review each pe petition. We make a decision on whether to institute a proceeding pretty much as a group. Uh, there are six, quote, examiners. These are these, you know, very experienced folks and four policy supervisor types like myself. I'm sitting in on these meetings where we're discussing each of these cases. Now, we will also bring in folks from our solicitor's office and the Trademark Trial and Appeal Board on a regular basis uh, to discuss specific cases or suspension issues. So there's a lot of inner office communication going on um, to, to try to make sure that we are, are you know, handling these cases in a, in a consistent manner. 
we are working really hard to follow the statute and follow the rules, but we are also working really hard to make sure that these proceedings are useful. Um, that is a delicate balancing act, and we are, are certainly finding our, our footing. We've gotten a few questions and suggestions about how to find expungement reexamination petitions. So if you don't know the serial number, how can you search for these proceedings uh, where a petition has been filed? The short answer is there is no searchable data field in TESS for registrations where a petition for reexamination or expungement has been filed. Now you think, oh, just add a data field so we can search it. Uh, harder than you think. <laughs> harder than you think. So what are our workarounds here? Um, the only place that an indication of whether an expungement or reexamination petition has been filed is in the prosecution history. That's in TSDR, but that's not really searchable. So we added, as you see on this, this um, slide here, we added a spreadsheet of petitions filed so you can find them easily. It include, includes the mark for you. Um, it has a link to the TSDR record for the registration and tells you whether the petition was filed for expungement or reexamination, the date the petition was filed. This spreadsheet is updated weekly. So when you are looking to see what has been filed and go in to look at the record, this is where you want to go. Now, though, what are we going to do? In the future. Well, this is exciting. Um, and this is a draft. So uh, I used to say draft on it, but somehow it went away. So this is uh, an enhancement of our uh, TMA petition transparency initiative. So this screenshot is a wireframe of a future database, future database that will contain several different buckets of trademark decisions. Now, the first bucket that I think you're going to be most interested in right now is, is the expungement and reexamination decision. So these will be both the notices of institution and decisions by the examiner. And now we also are going to create another bucket for those administrative sanctions um, decisions that I spoke about in, in public webinars last year as well. The third bucket would be petition to the director decision. So if you want to see um, petition decisions, that would be another bucket. And then we're going to have another one for precedential decisions. Maybe we'll even do TTAB decisions in there. Who knows? Who knows? But we are looking at a six month or more development process. But I wanted to let you know that we are trying to advance transparency here. Uh, we want you to be uh, able to find these cases more easily. Now, you probably are familiar. Remember I said we have our, our TMA webpage. We have information about the TMA. We have information um, that uh, we provided last year in public webinars um, where you can go and, and see the recordings from last year. Now, the new, um, the new information on this webpage is under limitations of proceedings and best practices. So these are some of the, the lessons learned that I'm going to share with you today we put on a webpage. So it's already, uh, you can just skip this presentation and go to the webpage. No, I want you to stay. We, you, you're going to want to hear the questions. But if you go to the webpage, uh, you'll see uh, more lessons learned there. And we are going to keep trying to add content there as we go. So what you all came here to, to, to find out is what are we seeing? What are the common mistakes we're seeing? So let's dive into that. So what do we want? Um, what have we seen so far in petitions that we want petitioners to stop doing or to start doing? So we want you to start doing the following. Number one, start giving us an index of the evidence. Make it a separate page. Label the evidence with the petition and match it to the index. Exhibit A, Exhibit B. That will make our life a lot easier trying to cross-reference what, um, what you're doing, what, what the evidence is supposed to go to, what goods and services you are using that evidence to show non-use for. Number two, start providing documentary evidence for each search you do, even if it's a negative search. That is, I did a search and I found nothing. Tell us, show, give us a documentary evidence of that. Show us the null search results. We want documentary evidence. Uh, if we don't want you to just say, I didn't find anything. Uh, we want to actually have the, the web results that, that show that nothing was there. Okay, what do we want you to stop doing as petitioners? Number one, stop shrinking the website evidence when you screen grab it. You should make sure we can read the URLs in case we want to create, recreate your search. We've had some cases where it's just shrinking the evidence so far down we can't see it. Well, then we have to do, issue a 30-day letter and you need to send us that evidence back so we can actually see what it says. Remember though, um, we need the legible URLs and we need the dates of access. They're required for web pages submitted as evidence. Would really appreciate that because your evidence doesn't do you any good if we can't read it. Number two, 
Stop providing only evidence of current non-use. Remember, these are um, these are proceedings designed to get at past non-use, not current non-use. We'll get to that in a little bit. I'll expand on that. But current non-use alone is not going to work. Number three, stop providing evidence of one bad specimen to challenge the entire class. One bad specimen goes to those goods that are shown in the specimen. It doesn't go to the entire class. You will need more than that to challenge the entire class, and we'll talk about that in a minute. Number four, stop referencing other registrations of the registrant without providing the relevant portions of the record. Don't just refer to these other registration numbers and say something about them. Give us the relevant portions that you want us to look at of the registration that you're talking about. Number four, I'm sorry, number five, stop providing entire records of other administrative or litigative proceedings rather than just the relevant portions. We're getting lost in these evidence data dumps and we may have to consider page limits. So give us what you specifically, the parts that you want us to look at. If you give us a whole proceeding with hundreds of pages, um, I think the, your, the persuasiveness of your, ev your evidence may get a little bit lost and you don't want that to happen. All right, reasonable investigation. The investigation is an element of a complete application, but it does not uh, replace the need for documentary evidence of non-use. Again, if you're you know, telling us that you did a search and didn't find anything, we want documentary evidence to show that. You're just telling us that that was your investigation, but we need, we need actual evidence of that. So provide evidence as the of the results of the investigation. Um, we've had affidavits of a non-use investigation and it was testimonial, basically, testimonial evidence of the search, but it did not give us uh, the documentary evidence that corroborates that testimonial evidence. So that's what we're, we're looking for. It's not enough to say you didn't find any hits. Um, you really have to, to give us evidence. Um, for example, a screenshot showing a search for a subject mark on Walmart, Target, Amazon, return zero hits. Um, you know, we want that screenshot. Uh, a screenshot showing a search of the Wayback Machine uh, archive.org that it returns zero hits, that's showing no past use. Um, that That's really helpful. We want to see that. We want to know the time period covered by the search that you did in archive.org. The evidence of non-use as of the relevant date is the key to a prima facie case. So if you're just searching Amazon and Google for current non-use, that doesn't tell us that it wasn't in use back in the relevant date. So current non-use is not going to be enough. Um, and here's, here's a tip. If the mark is a, just a design only element, do a reverse image search and show us the results. Don't do a search of the company name. You have to search the mark. Uh, and so it provide us uh, ex evidence of non-use of the image uh, by doing a reverse uh, image search in, in a search engine. That, that would be really helpful when we're talking about uh, a design only mark. Okay, next slide. And I, I've hammered this already, I'm sure. Current non-use is not enough. Okay, we've gotten several petitions with only an investigation of current non-use and document documentary evidence of current non-use, but it doesn't establish by itself a prima facie case of non-use as of the relevant date in the past. Uh, but nonetheless, we can consider it as part of a larger body of evidence as examiners are weighing that prima facie case, weighing the different pieces of evidence. Uh, next one, um, original specimen. So um, evidence that establishes that a digitally altered specimen that was originally submitted, that can be prima facie evidence of non-use as of the relevant date. Um, we're following examination practice. We're presuming that non-use of that good or service and the goods or services in the scope of that ID that was based on the digitally altered specimen, um, we can presume non-use based on the, the specimen. So let me, re let me repeat that. So we get, we get a, a bad specimen, uh, evidence of a bad specimen. It was digitally altered, mocked up, fake. Um, that bad specimen will be enough to show us that there is good evidence of, of non-use as of the relevant date for the good that's shown in that picture, in that specimen or any goods that could be covered by that specimen. However, that one specimen for that good doesn't establish a presumption of non-use for the whole class. That's, that's the thing. 
So examiners cannot presume non-use of the mark for the entire class of goods and services based on that one specimen. Um, we are aware that that specimen was offered for, that only one specimen was offered for that whole class, but we still can't institute proceedings on the whole class based on that one bad fake specimen. And you got to remember, this is not a fraud proceeding. You know, in fraud, if you have a tainted good, it, it can taint the whole class. That's, that's not what these proceedings are designed for. So lastly, um, moving to, to, to challenging the entire class. Now, okay, let's say you have evidence that digitally altered specimen. You have a fake specimen, you got good evidence of, of the, the, the specimen being uh, digitally altered. Now, add to that, add to that evidence of current non-use, uh, lack of U.S. presence of that owner, lack of an internet presence at all for the mark or for the owner, particularly if we're talking about consumer goods that are that are typically sold online. That, as a whole, may establish a reasonable predicate of non-use as to the entire set of challenged goods and services. So if you just give us this bad specimen, that's not going to be enough to challenge the whole class. You've got to give us more evidence that raises a, a presumption, raises an inference that, um, that there is non-use on all of the goods and services because the owner or the mark is just not showing up anywhere uh, on the internet, in the Wayback Machine, anything like that. We're looking for more. All right. I think I kind of already went over this documentary evidence of non-use. If you want us to consider your evidence, make it easy for us to, to find it. Index is great. Data dumps, not great. Um, if you want to rely on the record of a different registration, don't just give us the TSDR entries. Give us the relevant portions, the specific documents you want us to look at. Um, so, for example, if a maintenance document shows non-use or deletion of the goods at issue, provide that document, not just the entire TSDR printout. Um, while we may, you know, if you give us the, the TSDR printout, we may go and, and look into those records um, without specific relevant, you know, documentary evidence there. We, we may go in and look at it, but it's really at the examiner's discretion about what weight to give that. Um, so, avoid giving us evidence in the record that doesn't directly address non-use. All right. Now, once we've uh, reviewed the prima facie case, whether it exists or not, the reasonable investigation and the prima facie case, um, then we decide whether to institute proceedings or not. We will only institute on the goods and services for which a prima facie case has been made. Now, if we institute, I think I said this earlier, the registrant will get a notice of institution and an office action in one document. The notice will include the petitioner's evidence and request the registrant to rebut the prima facie case within three months. A one-month extension is available. Um, we have not received any registrant responses yet, so I don't have any lessons learned uh, to share with you on that. We're only dealing with the um, petitions and the notices of institution or non-institution. Uh, if the petition does not establish a prima facie case of non-use, we will issue a notice of non-institution. I know that sounds weird, right? Um, we're not calling this a decision. These are not normal 2.146 petitions. The, these are these are something different. So um, we're, we're calling this a determination, not a decision. Uh, a determination not to institute is not a denial. Uh, likewise, a determination to institute is not a grant. So we're not granting petitions or denying petitions. In this context, we are instituting proceedings or not instituting proceedings. Um, now, remember, the director's decision to institute or not is non-reviewable. So if the director decides not to institute, the examiner will indicate that the evidence was insufficient to establish a prima facie case. However, the examiner will not provide a detailed description of how the evidence was insufficient. And I'm sure that you all will be frustrated that we're not outlining in exhaustive detail where the petition went wrong. These notices are not designed to give the petitioner a roadmap for appeal. Remember, there's no appeal of the director's determination. So instead, I would direct you guys, pers prospective petitioners, to review the cases where the director instituted proceedings. What was the search? What was the evidence that worked in those cases? When you compare the different petitions and the outcomes, I think that will be instructive. That's your roadmap uh, for finding the successful future petition. Director-initiated proceedings. Now, we're in 
early days here. And we know neither the USPTO nor the petitioners knew or even still know what to expect with these petitions. So it makes sense that we've gotten sort of test case. We've gotten petitions where it looks like we're they're, we're being tested. How little evidence can I provide and still get the USPTO to institute? Or, you know, it, we, we've we faced a lot of deficient petitions, right? Um, we, we've faced cases where, um, you know, it, it seems like it's a fishing expedition. So um, a lot of these cases, there's almost a prima facie case, but just a better search would have uncovered some more. And we, we discover that when we do our search uh, and we look at what, what the petitioner's done uh, and may need a little bit more evidence. So um, in those cases where there's almost a case, but not a case, our examiners, you know, they, they want to just add the evidence. They can't. They are not allowed to supplement uh, a, an evidence uh, to perfect a deficient petition. That's not their job. That's the petitioner's job. So, you know, we're in early days and we recognize that we're sort of feeling each other out here, you know, with what's going to work in a petition. So we actually have helped out in uh, at least one case, and I think you'll probably see that a bit more. So in one case where the petition was deficient, we actually issued, a, you know, uh, we instituted on on the a case, on the goods where there was sufficient evidence, uh, we did a notice of non-institution on the goods where there wasn't good evidence. But then we turned around and we issued a director initiated proceeding to fill the gaps in the original petition. So where there wasn't enough evidence for us to institute on the petition, we then our examiners went and they found evidence. Um, and basically just added to it and uh, initiated a director uh, order proceeding uh, and, and filled in the gap that way. Now, if that happens repeatedly, these will be really good cases for you to look at because they show where the petitioner went wrong and how the USPTO determined that a prima facie case should have been established because we went ahead and filled in those gaps. But please, do not rely on the USPTO to institute director initiated proceedings on a registration for which you filed a petition, but you didn't provide enough evidence. We cannot save your petition in every case. That's a lot of resources. Um, so as our registrants' responses start coming in, or we find our own director initiated proceedings to, uh, to, to work on, we're not going to be able to spend a lot of resources supplementing uh, you know, deficient positions by, by adding on parallel uh, director initiated positions. So, so keep that in mind. Don't, re don't rely on us to clean up um, or find the evidence that, that you didn't go after uh, on your own. Um, we, we are, we're going to get stretched for resources pretty quickly as, as the re responses come in and we want to make sure we're able to um, be consistent in how we're treating these things. Okay. Um, suspensions. Let's talk about that briefly because we get we do get questions on this. Um, if you recall in the rule, um, it provides that expungement and reexamination proceedings can be the basis uh, for suspension of related proceedings. And that means that if the same registration uh, that's at issue in a TMA proceeding is the subject of civil litigation, uh, the TMA examiner may suspend those proceedings upon request and if otherwise appropriate, if civil litigation relevant to that registration is ongoing. So, you know, we, we can suspend our proceedings based on, on the civil litigation if you ask us and, and otherwise it's appropriate. Now, the same is true um, if the, same, the registration is the subject of a proceeding at the TTAB. Either proceeding may be suspended, the, the board's proceeding may be suspended, or the TMA proceeding may be suspended as appropriate, um, whichever uh, is is deemed to be um, uh, necessary to make sure that we're we're handling the case properly. Um, as I said before, remember TTAB folks are coming to our our TMA working group meetings, so we're we're talking about those suspensions and and when to do that. So there's a lot of communication going on. Now, if a registration um, is relevant, if the registration in a TMA proceeding is relevant to a, a Section 2D site in examination, or it's the subject of a maintenance filing, examining attorneys and post-registration staff may suspend on their own initiative or upon request uh, examination while relevant TMA proceedings are ongoing, if otherwise appropriate. So again, there's lots of different proceedings where the same registration may be relevant, uh, and the, the suspension rules that you normally, that you're used to at the board, they apply here. So we can suspend examination um, here or here, depending on what you need. So that is contemplated by the rules. A few more things. Um, section 7, request for amendment. We actually already had uh, a case where uh, a Section 7 request for amendment to narrow an identification of goods and services was actually pending 
prior to the filing of the TMA petition, and it was relevant to the TMA petition. So once the TMA examiner realized that the Section 7 request was outstanding, she asked the post-registration unit to expedite the processing of it, uh, of the registrant's request. So we were actually able to issue a notice of non-institution because the registration had, had been amended by way of that Section 7 request to narrow that identification of good and services and moot the TMA pr proceedings. So um, in that case, the petitioner probably should have checked to see if there was a, a Section 7 request pending already because they would have saved themselves um, $400. Um, so again, I, I think I've raised this in the past, please clean up your registrations. Um, anything that you're not using the mark for, the goods and services, do a Section 7 request for amendment before you get subject to a TMA proceeding uh, and so you don't get dragged into one of these proceedings. Clean up your registration, eliminate the goods and services out of your registration that are not in use. It is a zero fee. We will not charge you uh, when you're deleting goods and services out of the from a Section 7 request. Um, again, I, I think I, I talked about this earlier, but I, I just want to go over it one more time. Um, Deletions. You can, again, file the Section 7 request to amend the registration and delete the goods before you even get pulled into one of these proceedings, or you can do it while you're in the proceeding if you want to. Um, the registrant um, can just respond to the TMA office action by requesting deletion of the challenge goods and services. It's an easy way to just get out of the proceeding and, and uh, just delete the unused goods and services. Um, the registrant could decide not to respond to the office action and let those goods and services just fall away. They'll, they'll just be automatically uh, canceled. So the registrant could just ignore the office action and let, them, let those, those unused goods go. Um, but however, if the deletion, uh, the, the, the examiner requires deletion uh, in the office action for the TMA, if that happens simultaneously while the same registration is in the, in the middle of a maintenance examination, including an audit, there's a $250 deletion fee penalty. So to the extent that it within the maintenance examination, um, the good, there are goods and services that are required to be deleted um, in response to an office action, there's a $250 deletion fee penalty. If that happens at the same time you're in a TMA proceeding, you're gonna have to pay that penalty. Just, you know, you can't get out of it by virtue of deleting within the TMA. We're not gonna double charge you, um, but you can't get out of it simply because you're in a different proceeding where you're deleting goods and services. Now remember, if you don't pay that deletion fee penalty, the entire registration is canceled. It's not just the goods and services that are at issue, it's the entire thing. So keep that in mind, that deletion fee is a penalty uh, and it's designed to make sure that, that folks are keeping their registrations as accurate as possible. Now, um, we're learning a lot about these proceedings and, and it's, it, the, the people who are working on it actually really enjoy it because it's it's high level thinking, it's policy making on every single petition. We're learning a lot. We've got some some unexpected petitions coming in that we, we didn't think were, we didn't really contemplate, but you know, they, they work. They're, they're working in the context of these proceedings. Um, we had, in a, for example, we had a petition that alleged non-use in interstate commerce. Uh, there was clearly use in, in intrastate commerce, but the petition offered evidence of, of non-use in interstate commerce. It was good prima facie evidence, so we instituted proceedings. Um, another fact pattern that arose was where the original specimen submitted during examination uh, did not show use in commerce for the specific goods identified in the application. So obviously the original examining attorney just missed the issue that the, the specimen didn't match the ID. But now we have the opportunity to fix that mistake um, since a petitioner brought it forward. So uh, we're, we're going to do that. This, this, is, this is to fix our mistakes. That's re-examination. Uh, another variant of this kind of case was where the specimen that was originally submitted identified a website that never actually existed. And um, these were the kinds of goods that typically would be sold on a website. So defects in the original specimen submitted are something we will look at carefully to determine if a prima facie case is made for the goods and services that the specimen was supposed to originally support. So again, you know, these were unexpected, but it's perfectly contemplated within the statute and uh, we're happy to, to go with the flow and, and make these proceedings work for a bunch of different fact patterns. So that's really what I wanted to, to um, cover today. Uh, certainly we've got questions coming, but I do think we'll probably need to get together again in the future to discuss 
again, how these petitions are going and what we're seeing. Um, but in the meantime, for, you know, up-to-date information, follow our webpage updates. Um, look for our improvements to, and transparency to make sure that you see these petitions and see our decisions. We really did a lot of work with you all, uh, with your help to make these proceedings available. And, and certainly, if no one's interested in them, um, because they don't operate the way that everyone thought that that's not in anybody's interest. So we really do want to make sure these work and, and we're, we're happy to continue to, to work with you all to, to do that. So let's stay in touch about this. Uh, and I would like to take your questions uh, at this point. Uh, I believe we have a number of questions. So we will go back to the beginning and Bob and Montia will help me uh, as we go through. Okay. So we have at least four questions so far. So the first question is, a TMA um, costs $400 and requires a verified statement of reasonable investigation and documentary evidence. It would probably take more than $200 worth of time to put this together. A cancellation petition costs $600 and does not require the same investigation or evidence. It seems like much less work to file a cancellation petition. Why would anyone file a TMA proceeding, I guess? Um, and I think the answer to that question, and, and I have not practiced before the board, but I do think that anyone who's filing a petition for cancellation has obligations uh, under Rule 11, if I'm not mistaken, 37 CFR Rule 11, to make sure that anything that they file there is supported by investigation and was not filed for an improper purpose. Uh, so we weren't not necessarily trying to um, uh, require more than required in a petition for cancellation at the TTAB. Really, th that the same thing is required. So I, I, I take issue with the question that I, I don't think that the requirements are any different for uh, a non-use cancellation petition filed at the board versus a TMA petition. Uh, and presumably, you would file a TMA petition um, because you uh, don't want to necessarily pay, take the chance of not getting a default judgment and you want to avoid attorney's fees uh, if, perchance, there is no default judgment and you are proceeding through litigation before the board. The other point to make is, and, and a default proceeding, a default judgment at the board can be very quick, uh, but again, it's it's a risk. Uh, with with our proceedings, we're, we're hoping to get these faster and faster as we get used to them, uh, and hopefully they will, you know, facilitate um, mark clearance, the idea being you find a mark that you want to get off the register, you believe you've done your investigation, you have documentary evidence non-use, and you want that gone so it no longer blocks your application. Uh, and these proceedings are intended to allow you to do that um, more quickly than a regular board proceeding. Again, default judgment can be very quick. It's a choice you have to make um, which way you want to go. And remember at the TTAB, it's a $600 uh, petition fee. You can get a refund if there is uh, a default judgment, uh, which comes out to the same price as a TMA proceeding. That was kind of intentional. <laughs> so uh, that is the first question. Okay. Is there anything you want to add, Bob or Montia, on that one? I Yeah, I mean, I think that's that's it. It's the... It's a part of it is strategic and tactical, right? Do you, what do you think is going to be the result if you file a petition with the board? Are you likely to get a default? Then maybe it's a it's a wash. Um, and then the other issue, of course, is these TMA proceedings are limited only to use, whereas a petition to cancel before the board has many possible grounds. Um, and then there's also the idea of who has the burden when you when you file these. Um, here, you're effectively filing your petition, and then if it's instituted, the burden is on the registrant to prove use. Whereas in uh, petition to cancel before the board that goes forward, uh, it could get much more complicated in the, the burden uh, might be on the petitioner. Anything about Rule 11 that you want to say? Yeah, there shouldn't be any difference there, right? I okay. mean, a, an attorney making a filing, a, you know, establishing <clears throat> prima facie case of non-use, it's going to be the same level of, of work, I would think, and possibly more with the petition to cancel before the board. But that's, uh, you know, conjecture on my part. I think the <laughs> practitioners out there would have a, a better idea of, of the amount of work involved there. Fair enough. Okay, next question. Can one bring a TTAB cancellation proceeding after bringing an unsuccessful expungement or reexamination proceeding? 
Yes. Um, there is no estoppel um, with regard to uh, TMA pr proceedings that are unsuccessful. So certainly um, that petitioner or real party in interest can go to the board and challenge the registration for the same reasons. Uh, there is no estoppel, no, pr no claim preclusion. So great question. Thank you for raising that. Uh, is expungement 10-year limit waiver really until December 2024? Oh, you are correct, sir. <laughs> That's a typo. I am sorry. Yes. So TMA passed in 2020, December 2020. So there was a three-year period for expungement um, to be available uh, at any age uh, over three years. And that would end. Math is not my strong suit. Sorry. <laughs> Um, that would end on 2023. So, questioner, I really appreciate that. We'll have to we'll have to fix that. My my bad. Very sorry about that. You are correct. Uh, next question: How much does it cost to file one of these? Four hundred dollars per class. How long does it take? Uh, it depends on how quickly everybody moves. Uh, they're designed to take somewhere around. Well, they can be. They could be as fast as I don't know, three months. Um, they may hopefully take. Uh, no more than six to seven months. But, you know, as we're still finding our footing, it, it's taking us a while to sort of figure out, um, you know, work through these cases and making sure we're, we're making the appropriate institution decisions. Now, the registrant has three months extendable, another month to respond to the first action. So a lot depends on how quickly the, the registrant will respond as to how quickly these proceedings um, will go. But the idea that we were shooting for was somewhere between six and nine months um, if, if it all, ex, you know, extensions and, and the full time was taken for everything. What are the risks to the filer? Um, to the risk to the petitioner, four hundred dollars. Anything else on that, Bob? Well, I mean, it's like anything else, right? When you bring a an action potentially affecting someone's rights, then I think the practitioners out there have to consider the potential litigation risks that might arise from that. Um, right. So if if there's dueling registrations, then obviously that could be a, a trigger to some sort of counter litigation in another venue or, you know, potentially that party filing a petition against the, the petitioner's uh, registration, right? So, but nice. that's, that's not really <laughs> within the scope of this. This is, again, that's more of a practitioner's consideration. That's not our lane. Right. Yep. Got it. Okay. Next question, uh, has the USPTO set a time benchmark for how quickly it would make an institution decision on a petition? How about how benchmark for how quickly it will act on an office action response from a registrant? Overall, can you forecast how quickly the USPTO will turn around these two items? No. <laughs> I would like to. Um, certainly, we're moving as fast as we can. So. It, it's a function of not knowing how many petitions we were going to receive, um, how many examiners we would need to, to pull in to deal with these cases, how complex the cases are uh, in trying to make institution determinations, um, how much uh, research will the examiner need to do to check up on the, the investigation done by the petitioner. Uh, so there's lots of different variables and we don't have enough experience to be able to say, this is how long it's going to take. It's going to take two weeks. It's going to take one month. Um, when we have more experience, I think I'll be able to benchmark it. Um, but I, I can't really do that right now. I don't think it's it's reasonable. Um, I don't think it would be a, a good prediction as to how long these things would, would take. Um, so obviously, we don't want to be, we don't want to be slow. We want to move these things as quickly as we can. That's the whole point of these proceedings. So as I said, we're trying to make sure we balance uh, the interest there because we have done a whole lot of work uh, in trying to set these proceedings up and making them work, and they need to work. Um, and we know that, so we will do everything we can to try to move things along to make them valuable to our stakeholders. Uh, and so at this point, I can't give you a benchmark, but maybe in six months, maybe in a year, I'll be able to, well, six months, I might be able to give you a benchmark. So let's get back together next year or in six months, and then I'll tell you. Okay. If submitting Wayback Machine evidence, does it have to be certified? No. Um, we just need 
the dates that your the search covered. We need the URL. We need the date it was accessed, um, and that's normal normal type of, of documentary evidence that we're looking for. We're not looking for anything certified. Is that right, Bob? Yeah, and the entire petition is submitted under a verified statement and subject to 18 U.S.C. 1001 and Rule 1118. So again, you know, you have to do your homework on these and you're certifying that what you're submitting is true and um, that there's a reasonable basis for doing so. Yep. Next question, is the prosecution history of the challenge registration automatically in evidence? That's a great question. We've had this debate. Um, yes, you know, if, if it's the challenge registration, everything, you know, is, is um, we, can rely, we, can we can look at anything in that registration. But I will say, if you want us to see something in particular, if you want to draw us our attention to something in particular, give us that relevant evidence. <laughs> if you if it's buried inside a whole file, we may miss it. So certainly um, we are looking at the whole prosecution history for the most part, but if there's something that's really important to your case, please bring it to our attention by submitting that separately. That would be really helpful. Anything to add? Okay, um, next. Will an examiner suspend an application pending expungement or re-examination of a registration cited as a basis of refusal for that application? Yes. Bob's saying yes. Okay. They're, they're talking about, yeah. A 2D site, right? Normal 2D site in normal examination. I think when yeah. they say examiner, they're saying examining attorney, not a not the yep. expungement examiner, right? So. Yep, exactly. So just a no nomenclature again. Remember, we're not; these are not petitions under 2.146. There's not; they're not decisions. They're not grants. We are calling these TMA examiners examiners, not examining attorneys. Trying to differentiate, so we're being kind of careful in our nomenclature just to try to um, keep it all straight in our head. Okay. Um, is there any limit to how often and how many times these can be filed by either the same or different filer? Um, Yes. Well, against the same registration. Okay, let's talk about estoppel a little bit. So, under um, under the TMA, once a uh, a registration has been challenged and specific goods and services have been challenged, and it survives, the registrant is able to produce evidence of use, and we terminate the proceedings. Those specific goods and services that survived cannot be challenged again in a in a director in a proceeding before the director. Like I said before, you can go to the board, you can challenge them there, but you can't keep filing serially against though you know one specific good or service. If it survives, it's there's a stopper. Now you can challenge the same registration. So theoretically you could, you know, a petitioner could file against one good and that good, you know, survives. Then the petitioner files another one against the next one. Now if we find that this happens, we will then consider rulemaking to stop that from happening. Right now, we, as we went through the rulemaking process, we decided not to put any limits on the amount of time a registration could be challenged or the amount of time a particular petitioner could challenge numerous registrations, but we're watching. To the extent that a one petitioner keeps filing against a bunch of different registrations and the cases don't appear to be meritorious, we will note that information will go to our special task force and we will start investigating the petitioner to see if they are filing for improper purposes under Rule 11. If the petitioner starts is filing for improper purposes, then we can proceed against that particular person with sanctions. Uh, and we can preclude them from filing any further petitions. We can block their USPTO.gov account so they can no longer file anything before the USPTO. So to the extent that somebody uses these proceedings to harass registrants, we will note it and we will we can deal with it through our sanctions program. So keep that in mind. But um, it's already baked into the system that if a particular good has been challenged and survives the challenge, it can no longer be challenged by somebody else um, ever within the director um, sphere, the director proceedings. Again, it can go to the board. Okay, did that, was I clear on that? All right, good enough. Yeah, I feel so. Okay, can a petitioner be anonymous in the petition and request suspension in an application where it is the applicant 
and a 2D refusal was issued via the petition registration. Yes. Right? Because it's the same registration. Right. So yes, a petitioner can always be an anonymous in the sense that it's not the real party in interest. It's just a person's name. You can't be totally anonymous. You have to give us your name. You have to give us your address. You have to give us your email. So you're a person. You have to have a USPD.gov account. And with ID verification, we're going to know who you are. Now, are you the real party in interest? Not necessarily. Um, we're, we did not deal with, we did not address that issue in the rulemaking because at the end of the day, if there's a prima facie case, we should institute proceedings. Doesn't matter who filed it. If it's meritorious, we should, we should clean up the registration. Absolutely. Okay, so if a petitioner um, files, but and a different person is asking for suspension within within examination, right? Because the the relevant registration and is at issue, then yeah, I, that seems is that right, Bob? We might have to yeah. take that back, but I think that's right. No, yeah, it. I th I get the, I. My understanding of the question is the petitioner has filed against a registration and that registration is also cited against the petitioner's application. So the petitioner wants us to decide the petition before proceeding with the application where there was a 2D. I, yeah, I don't think we've talked about that, but that seems like normal suspension procedure yeah. to me. I don't think there's anything improper there. Right. Okay, is there a limit to how often and how many times he can be filed? I just answered that. All right. Is that our last question? I let's see. Do we want to switch over to the new category? Because not all of them have been published. It looks like. Yeah, I see that. OK. Well, we're getting very close to the end and we do have to shut it down. But uh, there is one question uh, that came in and I understand, Amy, you might have been thinking about addressing it uh, today, and it's uh, one we can do pretty quickly, and that is uh, what sort of an investigation is needed uh, if a trademark is a design-only trademark? Is there anything like a search that might be deficient, and what would you be looking for in that circumstance? Uh, would You got to look for the design. Um, you can't just look for the registrant or the company name of the registrant. You have to actually look for the mark at issue. So to the extent that a reverse image search within, you know, various um, online sites would be helpful to show that you actually did search the design, that's kind of kind of necessary for um, instituting uh, a proceeding against the design only mark. So just doing a search of the applicant's name is, or the registrant's name is, is not going to cut it. You actually have to be looking for the mark at issue. Um, if it's a design only mark, we recognize that's challenging, uh, but Google has this great reverse image search feature. So I would, I would urge you to try that. Excellent. All right. Well, thank you very much. Uh, I'm sorry that we're going to be unable to get to all of your questions today. There were there were a lot of you who tuned in for this webinar, so unfortunately, we're not going to be able to get to everyone's question. But uh, thank you so much for being here, and thank you so much for uh, sending in your questions. Uh, for those of you who want a replay, don't worry, there will be. Uh, so the recording for this should be posted, as I mentioned at the beginning of the webinar. Uh, it should be posted within about three weeks from now. Uh, and there's lots of great information that we have um, on the website as well. So be sure to check out um, everything that's up there, um, specifically if you're interested in the Trademark Modernization Act, or if there are other things that you're interested in. We have all sorts of events that are always happening at the USPTO. Uh, I know that we have a Women's Entrepreneurship Symposium coming up later this week. Uh, and if you're someone who wants to learn more about patents, uh, we have uh, lots of patent information. There's also one about trade secrets, I believe, coming up next week. And of course, we also have our Trademark Basics Bootcamp. Uh, a lot of you on the call today are, uh, are well advanced beyond the basics. Uh, but for those of you who might have tuned in uh, and might be looking for some basic trademark fundamentals, be sure to check out our Trademark Basics Bootcamp. And we also have a similar program if you want to learn patent basics, it's called the Path to a Patent Program. And both of those uh, eight week courses uh, begin next week. So thank you again for being here. Uh, we appreciate your time and we will see you next time. Thanks so much and take care.